Aloha and welcome to the Hawaiian Affairs Committee hearing. I'm Senator Miley Shimabukuro, the chair. Other members of the committee are Vice Chair Senator Kurt Favela, Member um, Senator Leslie Hara, uh, Member Senator Jared Keohukalole, and Member Senator Tim Richards. This hearing is being streamed live on YouTube. You can find links to viewing options for all Senate hearings and meetings on the live and on-demand video page of the legislature's website. If you're interested in seeing the written testimony, you can go to the legislature's website, which is capital.hawaii.gov. In the unlikely event we must abruptly end this hearing due to major technical difficulties, the committee will re reconvene to discuss any outstanding business, and a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. For all people testifying remotely, um, all testifier audio will be muted and video disabled until it's your turn to testify. According to the committee's practice, there's a two-minute time limit per testifier, um, which can be adjusted, though, depending on um, our, our load. If there are, are temporary technical glitches during your turn to testify, we may have to move on to the next person due to time constraints. We appreciate your understanding and remind you that the committee has already received your written testimony. Members, please wait to ask your questions for testifiers until we have gone through all the testifiers for that measure. Okay, so with that, we will begin with SB 200. This is related to partial public financing of elections. And first we have um, Campaign Spending Commission in support. Are they on, on Zoom? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Shima Bukuro. Uh, my name is Gary Cam, and I am a uh, general counsel for the Campaign Spending Commission. Uh, thank you for hearing uh, our bill. Uh, the Amounts available under the partial public financing program has not been changed since the mid 90s. Uh, so the commission felt that it, it was time to take a look at the amount and uh, uh, make adjustments upwards to all the uh, in, in general, the, depending on the, the office, the, the increase amounts are 40% to 50%. And, but it's more significant for OHA. For OHA candidates, it's probably over a thousand percent jump. Uh, OHA being at $1,500 for the whole election period, uh, it, it's very low for our office that is a, you know, runs statewide. So we felt that a more significant increase needed to be uh, done for uh, OHA candidates. And the other, uh, the other, uh, adjustment we made was to change the matching fees for the uh, excess of, of the qualifying contribution amounts from a dollar to dollar match for, to a two dollar to a dollar match. So that would help the candidates reach the maximum amount allowable quicker. Um, I'm here to answer any questions that you, you, uh, your committee might have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kim. I'm so pleased to see you folks um, pushing for this measure. Um, next, we have Dan Foley, who's the um, chair of the Commission to Improve Standards of Conduct in support. Anyone else here for SB 200? Okay. Seeing that members, any questions? Okay, then we're going to move on. SB 731. And this is um, relating to um, Hawaiian Independence Day. And first, we have um, Cheryl in support. Dana Keave also in support, and then Dr. Kent Conklin opposition. Is there anyone else for SB 731? Chair. Oh um, yes. Hi, Comptroller from the State of Hawaii. Yes. Um, we offer our written testimony in support of this measure, and have, uh, also have our archives um, administrator here to answer any questions. That you oh, may very have. good. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Mahalo, Chair, Vice Chair. Okay, members. thank you. <coughs> okay, anyone else here for SB 731? Yes, any questions? Anyway. Okay, we're moving right along. Very good. SB 732. This is relating to um, state holidays designating the second Monday in October each year as Indigenous Peoples Day. So first we have D Heard with comments. Aloha. Good afternoon. Chair Shibokuro and, and Vice Chair Favela. Uh, my name is Brenna Hashimoto. I'm acting actually as the chief negotiator uh, in addressing this uh, bill. We would like to offer comments in that um, holidays are 
a subject of negotiations. And so to keep that in mind, although the legislature can designate holidays, add and, and delete, uh, that is a, a subject that's um, negotiated with the unions. So in order to uh, actually effectuate it as a day off, we would have to do that through collective bargaining. Okay. So I'm available if you have any questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Members, we'll go through the testifiers and then have questions at the end. Um, next, we have budget and finance with comments. Then we have um, City and County of Honolulu, D. Heard, with comments. Volcano School of Arts and Sciences in support. Uh, and then these are all individuals in support of this measure. We've got Cheryl, Michelle Brown, Lynn Matisau, and if you're here, just you can pipe up. Jason Balagot, Kim Miller, Jasmine, Angelin Rose Carvalho, Christian, Orion Kai Harbor, Kalia Andrade, Kelton Singleton, Aliyah, Kiana, Kaimana, um, Kaba'aho Young, um, Persayez, Aiden, Mackenzie, Darcy, Kanihailua Kalani, uh, Luftia Martin, and then we have Dr. Ken Conklin in opposition. Is anyone else here for SB 732? <coughs> Seeing none, members, questions? Okay. Seeing none, qu questions? Yes. This is Steve Halby, huh? Yes. Um, okay, who was it, Deher? No. Yeah, yeah. Could you come? <coughs> Did you say you're working on this bill? Somewhat. Yes. Well, <laughs> uh, well you know the. Um, uh, we still have, I think, the state holiday as a uh, holiday, paid holiday. The, the election day, actually, that's actually every other year. Yes, a, uh, correct. That's a paid holiday, and, and we don't really need that. So my, my question is, have you looked at, um, from the negotiating with the unions and the budget side, to have to take away a holiday, to put in a new mm -hmm. holiday? To my past. knowledge, yes. so I've only been in this capacity for a short while, so um, I'm not aware that that's been proposed as a, a trade-off. Mm -hmm. I do rela uh, recollect that many years ago there was a trade-off. Um, I think it was Discover's Day was yeah. eliminated and Martin Luther King Jr. Day was um, added as an observed holiday. Right. But to my knowledge, it, this hasn't been discussed recently. Okay. But in any case, it would have to be negotiated with the respective collective bargaining because if this bill moves forward, then I think uh, Good Friday was one of those days, which is a religious holiday. Um, not sure what other, you know, if there's not another one in October, that's fine. Yeah. There's no holiday in October. Yeah, so if there's one there, we could consider. Mm -hmm. uh, we you still know have. Is not holiday? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hello, yeah. <laughs> um, but. If this move, move, bill moves forward, could you look at that? Maybe we can look at that. That's a compelling, yeah. very compelling suggestion, yeah. though. Yeah, some other, like and then it's not maybe scheduled evenly, but that's another issue in terms of mm -hmm. the workers, you know, getting um, once a month generally. I think we have two extra holidays because of uh, uh, Prince Kuhio Day. And, there are uh, two holidays in January. Uh, New Year's Day and as well as um, Martin Luther King Jr. Day and <coughs> Thanksgiving and Veterans Day both fall in the month of November. Mm. Okay. And then we have March <coughs> is I think Kuhio Day. And, uh, and then where does Good Friday fit? It varies. Yeah. It's the Friday before um, Easter so it sometimes it falls in March and sometimes yeah, right. it falls in April. Okay. Okay. So sometimes it, it it has a double a two in March, and, correct? And sometimes just okay. That's right. Okay, well, just to, because to get it passed something like that would would I think that we might want to consider that. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you. Any other questions? Sure. Um, yes. Vice yes. Sir. Who, who's the, who's the, uh, into the canoe? Yes. Maybe you can ask him why he had. Um, decided to choose um, the second Monday of October. Maybe, maybe they had a reason. 
Yeah, I know this came from uh, students in his district. Yes, maybe is the significance of why they chose the second Monday of October. So, I mean, we can ask them too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, at the yeah. team board. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a, um, what day is Columbus Day? I know that was one of those, instead of, yeah. you know. That's uh, right, they were going to call it the last day that the indigenous folks were. Well, oh, that's what they're talking about now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so anyway. Oh, it's the same day. Oh. Oh, so that's. So that October is 2nd is Columbus right. Day. That was the Oh, so okay, it's already so, a holiday. No, Columbus Wait. Day is not a oh, not, that's not a paid holiday. Yeah. Discover oh yeah, they just right. Discovers that. And I'm okay. Oh, that's right. right. I'm okay. Right. I think it's some people trade off or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's going to be switched. Discovers. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Interesting food we thought. Other questions? Okay. Okay. Seeing none. Um, then we're going to move on. Uh, we are now on SB 733. This is requiring OHA to establish and maintain Hawaiian culture centers within the state. And so first we've got um, Cheryl in support, um, Dr. Conklin, opposition, and then we have Keo Mailani Hirata in opposition. Anyone else here for SB 733? If you've done members, any questions? Good bill. <laughs> okay, then we're going to move on. Um, SB 740. This is requiring DHHL to digitize its applicant, beneficiary, and lessee records by creating an interactive digital database software program. Um, and so first up, we've got DHHL uh, in support. Okay, thank you so much. The Shaw um, with comments. And then we've got um, Dr. Conklin, comments. Pui Kako'o Aina Ho'opula Pula with comments. And then we've got Dana Keave, support. Joanne Iwohi, Zero support. Miley Luuwai, um, Keokaha Panaepa Farmers Association. Marlene Purdy, all in support. Anyone else here for SB 740? None. Members, any questions? Actually, I'd like to ask DHHL. I, I, yeah, we'll find out. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, we had a little bit of offline discussion. I just wanted to have, you know, in front of the members and public to hear. So um, my understanding is that DHHL is proposing that the July 1, 2024 deadline in the bill, rather than having that be the deadline to impl implement, um, you're willing to go with the deadline for that to be when you conduct your assessment, finish your assessment of um, how much it's going to cost and what it's going to take to digitize the records. Would that be good? We can, we can do that, Chair. Okay. Okay, so to clarify, Members will be so July 1, 2024, with a deadline for DHHL to complete an assessment of digitization. And now, is that something that DHHL, um, and I see if you supported it, so you're already going in this direction? We are going in that direction now, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair. We've been working on this uh, prior to my arrival over the past, at least the past administration. And this is a priority for our department to provide solid benefit for our beneficiaries. Okay. Very good, very good. So they'll, they'll be happy to hear that. Oh, and then how much do you think? Yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. I guess you at that you don't really know the cost until you do the assessment. Uh, well, we estimate uh, phase one three million dollars due to the highly customized nature of of the applications across our system. We're looking at the time frame in discussions with staff two to four years. We're also we also believe this is going to take significant staff involvement. Okay. So. Um, my administration has been in discussion with our IT office uh, over the last four weeks that we've had the keys to the building. So around so it's three, a priority for us. Three million, did you say? You think it's the cost that might cost? That's what we've estimated as of right now, Madam Chair. Okay. okay. And would that allow people to apply online? Would that allow people to apply online? Uh, Chair, I don't. You know, whether we'll be able to apply online once we're PAL, that's that's the hope. That's the hope. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I saw once we're all PAL. Okay. Yes. Um, Senator, can you uh, pull away? Chair, have you? Yes, sir. Uh, well, to your knowledge, because as you mentioned, a lot of this was rolling as you've come on. Mm -hmm. uh, what engagement has there been with ETS about the IT governance process that manages large IT projects? Mm -hmm. uh, Senator, may I bring our staff forward, please? Senator, thank you for that question. So I know DHHL has engaged in conversations with ETS and what makes the most sense. 
Oh, sorry, Lehua <laughs> Kili Lao Kano with the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Um, I think because a lot of our records, just to explain why our system is a little bit more complicated, maybe not, other state systems have, but besides having our lessee and our applicant records, we also have like loans, and so payments need to, invoices need to be sent to lessees, payments need to be made and tracked, so all the mortgages. What we don't have in the system yet is tying it to our land base, and so that's one of the ideas that we'd like to do is to integrate the GIS system as well, overlaying. Um, so we have systems, but many of them don't talk to each other, and that's one of the things with that initial assessment so we can get a handle of what, what we have and what's gonna be the best way forward. So I hope that helps so answer. I would highly encourage some engagement with ETS as this bill moves forward. And the reason I say that is that the language you're using in this testimony, specifically that due to the highly customized nature of your processes, you know, we need this X amount of million dollars that has been cited in audit after audit when it comes to failed IT projects in state agencies. That's what every state agency says as the justification for why they need multiple million dollars on an IT system. And the IT governance process was formulated so that the types of assessments that you referenced earlier can be done in the office so that we're not building these overly expensive customized systems that require multiple million dollar M&O in perpetuity thereafter. Because I, yeah, I think this is a great thing <laughs> and let's make sure we can try and do it right. Thank you. Chair. Sure. Yes, Senator Richards. Yeah, thank you. I uh, just echo, echoing um, the comments. You know, I hear customized software, but there may be something out there, and I, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I'm very mindful of you start creating something so unique, it takes a tremendous amount of finances and effort to maintain. So and I would imagine there's probably something out there that might work. So. I'd encourage you to engage and then look. I think it's sure. Or, or I dare say, operations in the department might have to change to accommodate the new system. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Very, very fair. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, just, just in on that one. That, um, and not, not only um, when, when you guys um, look into the software that you guys are going to use, um, I mean, I, I never know is that complex with the, the loans and stuff. That's good to know. <clears throat> I was just thinking about the list with names, not just the loans and everything like that. So that, that's even greater. But even with the money you guys are um, looking to um, use, uh, $3 million, within that, um, Jerry, are you guys going to think about getting more staff dedicated, Chair Anderson, to that, um, um, to, I don't use the word expert, like to, to work on the plan on, going forward because we know it's needed. I mean, did you guys uh, put anything like that in you guys' budget into try budgeting for something like this? I know you say it's going to take a lot of staff, but did you, um, instead of using, uh, overworking the staff that you have, are you guys thinking about adding a few more people to this um, digitizing for the beneficiaries? Thank you for the question, Vice Chair. We'll first look to uh, be able to accommodate in our existing vacancies. We're going to try that first, Senator. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Seeing none, we're going to move on to, we now have SB 741. This is excluded from the, any wait list maintained by DHHL, any lessee or successor who sells or transfers their lease on attractive wine homelands. And so first up, we have DHHL. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very All right, and they have um, comments, thank you. Then we have um, Hui Kako O Aina Ho'opulopula Pula with comments. We have the Shaw uh, comments. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Conklin support. Joanne Iwohi support. Marianne Kapuniai comments. Uh, Michelle Brown support. And then these are all opposition Marlene Purdy, Jarek Medeiros Garcia, and Tara Rojas. Anyone else here for SB 741? See none members any questions? Okay. I guess for DHHL, I guess wanted to, um, uh, we kind of had an offline discussion about how we handled this bill last year, just kind of wanting your feedback. And it seems like the concerns, what I'm hearing from you folks is that it's a very small percentage of people that 
do this, number one. And number two, your concern is that um, you know, there are people who need to do it for, you know, between family members or because of illness. Or, so what if we were to amend the bill to say that it's only going to be if people sell or transfer for personal gain? I believe you did that last year, yeah. Senator. So we we were okay with that. But again, our we really feel the unintended consequences. You heard you see the other testimony from beneficiaries. They have a lot of concerns. And frankly, I don't think this is gonna stop the problem from occurring that Senator the, the, the introducer is trying to accomplish, frankly, because they don't have to be on the wait list to purchase a lease. Yeah. That's true, right? Any one, any fifty percent or more. Oh, really? As long as you're fifty percent, you can um, receive. Uh, you know, you can, and you can be able to show that you're fifty percent. You can purchase. Lease. Oh, I thought you had to be on the list. From a willing seller. Yeah. No, no, I thought you. Oh, wow, that's, that's even more. I mean, you still have to substantiate that you are at least. Oh, yeah, I know that. But if, like, what I'm saying is, if if a wife who's fifty percent finds somebody willing to sell them, she don't have to be on the list. I can go back and confirm that with our staff, but to my knowledge, I don't believe the law requires that you have to be on the wait list to purchase. You, you just have to transfer, it has to be another native client. Now, where the wait list might come up is have they been able to substantiate that they are 50%, mm. right? So. Yeah. Oh, interesting. It's, it's really, yeah, it's an interesting problem. It's That's interesting. the challenge, and, and as you saw, the study we did pretty extensively thanks to this legislature enacting, I mean, it is a small percentage, so you're legislating for the small percentage, but it's going to impact all lessees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, I mean, again, um, you, you recommend that we, this, this bill is not necessary? You know, I, I understand that the introducer has, has valid concerns, and the issue, we, we all are aware of the issue, but we don't think that this fix is going to accomplish what she's trying to fix, fix in, our, in our humble. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Senator Kiyoko. Be because you can, you can address at least the transparency issue through the commission. Every month, our commission reports always shows assignments, and it tells you who it's assigned to, what's if they have a relationship, what's the reason. Every month, our commission has reports on that. So. That is transparent and public. But you can also take action through the commission to note on the wait list who's eaten and who hasn't. Mm. Take that back. Yes. Take that back. To identify on the wait list if there are prior, let's see. If, if, okay. yes. Mm. Yeah. Good. And I or to note whether, the, you know, I mean, because as mentioned in the testimony, there are unfortunate circumstances where people got to go, mm. right? But if you've come back and acquired three, four, five leases above the thousands of people who have not acquired any lots, the commission can take action right now under the HHCA to illuminate that. So the rules do state that basically you would, anyone who hasn't received a, an award would be considered first. So let's just say for discussion purposes, there's someone on the wait list now who had received an award before. Everyone on the list, even the people behind that individual, would receive an award before that individual because you're a prior lessee. But to your point, I'm trying to pull up the, the wait list now because I know we have different codes already. I'm just not aware of a code for if they're a prior lessee, and I will definitely take that back to, to staff if that is um, you know, your recommendation that at least there's some kind of indicator that this individual was previously a lessee. If, well, was, if, is that what I'm if the department's position is that the bill is not necessary, then I'm just confirming that the department recognizes that part of the reason why the bill is not necessary is because the commission can take action on this right now. There's nothing prohibiting the commission in the act from amending its rules to address this Correct. exact, the, at least the specific reasoning for the bill, right? Okay. Senator, I'll recommend that the commission have that discussion. Because and then it might be it's a valid point, Senator. more appropriate before the commission anyway. Okay, it's a valid point, Senator. Um, another question that I have actually that just came to my mind is, um, I know like with HHFDC, you know, when they have um, you know affordable housing that people buy and stuff, there's often those right of first refusal written into the. Is that could that be something that could possibly have DHHL or? Is that, I don't know if that's 
outside of your um, ability or in terms of monetary, budgetary wise? Or? That's the way it works now. I mean, oh yeah, so okay, so if someone's gonna sell, they have to first offer it back to you folks. No. Also, there's no right of first refusal. But or, in terms of, well, yeah, I guess you're right. Okay, I mean, would that be helpful? You know, if we if we made it like HHFTC, where it's saying, okay, if I'm gonna sell, um, you know, I at least have to say, DHHL, you have the first, you know, chance to buy it back, to put add it back to the trust, and then offer it to people on the wait list. I'll take your back. Okay, so cons possible consideration. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let yes. us know if that's something that would be good. Yeah. Trust. Yes. Richard, yeah. Please. I'd like to weigh in on this a little bit. I mean, I, I hear the concern. I, just, I think I understand why the concern is there, but to the point on that, if we're talking about a within a a family that may change things a little bit, it's interesting because the threads through this are the same threads that we see we're seeing in agriculture right now, a DOA and the ag leases about selling leases and things like that. So, um, and like you say, life happens, and we have to be mindful of that. And someone has to, for whatever reason give up a lease, whatever the case may be. And I don't know what the exact answer is, but I'm, um, I think the latitude, and maybe it's a better way, if that's what, um, Chair, you're thinking that we don't need this, and can be just handled through the commission, that may be a better way. But um, I, I think the conversation is very apropos, though. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And Senator Richards, I'm happy to take that back to the commission, to have that policy discussion. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay, then we're going to go on to the last bill on our measure, which is SB 1014. And this is uh, independent counsel, allows DHHL to retain independent legal counsel, uh, authorizes DHHL to use services of AG as needed. Okay, so first up we have um, Attorney General's Office in opposition. Good afternoon, Senators. Uh, Deputy Attorney General Ryan Kanakaoli for the Department of the Attorney General. Um, the Department opposes this bill and uh, requests it be held in committee. Um, our points are contained in our written testimony, but I would like to emphasize uh, several things. Um, first, uh, much of the legal work um, that we do that is done for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands is unique to government, um, and it would be difficult and certainly not cost efficient uh, for private attorneys to replicate the same things that we do. Um, second, our office has in place already um, ethical safeguards um, that allow um, our deputies to zealously advocate for the interests of DHHL. Um, for example, our office has represented DHHL against uh, DLNR um, before the Commission on Water Resource Management and on Appeal. Um, and finally, if there is a conflicting um, position um, of DHHL that our office cannot take. Um, there is a process already in place um, for DHHL to seek a waiver from the Attorney General and uh, with the approval of the Governor to go and hire its own private attorneys. Um, and this has happened in the past without any incident. Um, so again, we um, ask uh, that this bill be held in committee and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have DHHL in support. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and Senators. Uh, respectfully, uh, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands uh, will disagree with the prior department and we will strongly support this bill. At times, uh, Madam Chair and Committee, the interests of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands will be different uh, than the state of Hawaii. And so we would ask that we'd be able to retain our own legal counsel much the same manner that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs can. And we ask for your favorable consideration, please. Thank you very much. Okay. Next we have um, Dr. Conklin with comments, Marion Kapuniai support, Shaw support, Keokaha Panaeva Farmers Association support. Anyone else here for SB 1014? You know, members' questions. Yes, Senator Ihara. Could both of you come up? Actually, for uh, Hawaiian Homelands, is there, could you uh, cite a court case or legal pr 
proceeding in the past that you believe um, there was a conflict of interest, or what would be one that is the, the most clear conflict example of a conflict of interest that we would want to not repeat? I will admit I've only been with the department since 2016. I cannot think of a specific, oh sorry, Lehua Kini Laukano with the Department of Finance. I cannot think of a specific case, but I can go back to our staff to see if they are aware of any cases. I think the big concern is that we always have to ask for permission. Even that ask alone, that process, um, I would raise one, and I'm not necessarily saying that the AGs didn't do a good job, but there's definitely different interests would be the Mauna Kea Access Road. As an example, where we have very unique interests from the state. So I, and I'm not saying they, they miss, um, they didn't handle it properly. I, properly, I just say that our interests are very unique. Right, so the process to get to the positions which you're describing as a conflict. So they you talked about the, the process and so you um, uh, so if you set aside the process, you know how you get to basically well let me ask you this. Did the did the department ask the AG to go through the process that they he described and they were yes, screwed we down? I believe on Mauna Kea Access Road, we asked for independent counsel. I can't recall off the top what, what was the end result of that. The, for Mauna Kea Access Road, I cannot recall whether, I can't even recall whether there was a request for representation for the department in the, for the waiver itself, um, but there was a request regarding the Act 14 issue that was underlying the Mauna Kea um, case and in that situation it went through the waiver process and approval was granted and the Commission did hire counsel yeah because we get this bill regularly yeah. right and so I'm trying to might as well go a little deeper to say um, so I guess the issue is it is the process now we'll go back to the process you're saying the process, I know it may not be really respectful and, you know, whatever, but is their process uh, insufficient to identify conflicts which then should have an independent counsel? So I think it's that DHHL has to ask for independent counsel when it's needed. And to, to the Attorney General's point, I don't, I'm not aware of situations where we were denied, but I do know, like, say, for example, the Mauna Kea Access Road, that road went originally, went out of DHHL's inventory without DHHL's even say in that originally, if you take the, the action back to its original genesis. And those are the kinds of issues that I think are concerning, that we have to be mindful of, that maybe independent counsel would be more appropriate, is all I'm suggesting. So if you had independent counsel, then you could look back and try to fix some of the actions that arose out of a possible conflict or lack of sensitivity to a conflict, as you alluded to in the history of that access road. I don't know if it could be undone, but I think those issues need to be resolved. Right. So they can be addressed. Yes. And so if you have legal, independent legal counsel, then you can address it from your lens, not through um, the G. Okay. Well, that's a, a new justification that I've heard. Okay. Yes, Senator So, if the commission uh, has an agenda item that has a legal, that have legal questions associated with them, normally, um, those questions are dealt with in the executive session when the Attorney General's office is providing legal advice, right? That's correct, Senator. And if based off of those, well, whether it's executive session or on the record, if based off of the Attorney General's legal advice, the Commission 
determines that it needs to take further legal action or, or, or specific legal action, that is the point in the process in which the commission, it, is that the point in the process where, and then what is that, what is the procedure from there? Does the commission direct the chair to make a request to the governor that the attorney general make themselves available uh, potentially in a litigation type type of situation? That's the, is that the extra step you're talking about? Yeah, so as I understand it, and Ryan can correct me, usually a letter is generated from DHHL that basically asks for independent counsel for a specific, it's usually litigation yes, that yes. I'm more familiar with. Have like there Nelson. been instances when the Attorney General has advised the commission that they need to engage in litigation and that the request to the governor for assistance was denied? I do not recall any denial of request for um, to obtain independent counsel that I've, in my experience, that I've processed. Um, the okay. typical um, the memo comes into our office um, with the request. We, our office, makes a a recommendation um, to the governor, and the governor, you know, makes a decision on that recommendation, but. In my experience, the recommendation has, when the requests come in, they've been to approve. You weren't around for the Nelson case, in right? The, no, I was not. But in the Nelson case, there was an approval for independent counsel in that situation. And in fact, the, um, the attorney that, the private attorney that was assigned to the case, that was hired by DHHL, is still on the case. And that's the same for Kalima as well? In the Kalima case, our office is handling the settlement. Um, I'm not aware if there was any uh, request for- Well, I guess that doesn't have anything to do with the department at this point anyway. Yeah. So not a good example. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, yeah. Um, the questions. You know, this got me thinking, I mean, what if we kind of did like a halfway where it says, you know, we kind of leave it where, um, you know, the default would be using the AG, you know, if, if for DHHL's legal purposes. However, um, with independent counsel would be automatically triggered if the opposing party is the state. So rather than DHHL having to make a request and ask the governor to get approval, it's just a trigger where it's like, okay, if we're talking about, you know, DOT taking our role on Mauna Kea, we're talking about state not paying us adequate sufficient sums, you know, um, then clearly you know, you're talking about, you know, you having to take two state agencies in a lawsuit. Um, would that be kind of a halfway point? I'll have to take that back with me. I, I haven't considered that um, option. Um, there have been situations where the department has, like, like I said in an earlier example, there have been situations where the party um, the opposing party to the Department of Hawaiian Homelands was another agency. And typically that's um, the situations, the adverse situations that, have, that arise. It's uh, DHHL, DHHL and, for example, DLNR mm -hmm. on the op yeah, opposite yeah. side. Um, I can't think of a situation where the state generally has been a party yeah. against DHHL. Because I know, like, I mean, you know, I, I work at Legal Aid, right? I mean, and and it's like, even if, you know, if, uh, yeah, within our firm, right, like it's like if someone at, in the Kauai office represented the husband and then the wife comes to Hawaii and applies, I mean, even though we're two separate, uh, that would be a conflict, right, because one office, but then like, here, right, I mean, all the AGs, you folks are all in the same building. Yes. We have the, the DLNR AG, the DHL AGs, but I guess it's kind of the same, they're the same firm. Um, so I don't know how you folks feel about that. I was going to ask you, uh, Madam Chair, could you? Please restate your proposed comfort, your proposal. Um, yeah, I mean, it's how I mean. This I think I understand how a lot of law firms work, where uh, you know the, the the default is going to be that the attorney general is going to be your lawyer. Yes. You know, for whatever you know. Thing. Okay. However, if the opposing party is the state, um, then it's just automatically they're disqualified. You know, so so you're going to then automatically that will trigger you having to go to independent counsel. And it's like, yeah, it's like how in court, you know, right? If there's, if, if, if the court determines there's a conflict of interest yes. with the public defenders, for instance, mm -hmm. then they're going to say, okay, well, now you've got to go to the appointed, list of appointed counsel. 
So I'll that's reasonable to I don't know. to me, Chair. That sounds reasonable to me, Chair. Sure. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I was just going to weigh in on that yeah. um, because I think that is a hybrid. It'll look more because for DHHL, you know, it's talking about government within government, and uh, with all respect to the Attorney General for government. Um, functions, I can understand the AG. But that being said, DHHL is a little bit different. And so um, having that representation, you know, if it's DHHL and DLNR, that's trying to serve two different masters from the AG perspective. So I think what you're asking for is reasonable. And that would, if you have that trigger, if it's agency, versus agency, then that would allow DHHL to seek outside. And I think, I think you're onto something here, Chair. Maybe, yeah. yeah so I don't wait, know. Wait, we're gonna say something now? Yeah, so in those situations where it's agency versus agency, the, the conflict wall is established between the, the opposing um, councils, um, whether it be me and my colleague in, in the land division for the, in a situation where it's DHHL versus DLNR. Mm -hmm. And then that conflict wall goes all the way up uh, through the super supervisory levels too. So, for example, in the um, the uh, commission, the sea worm case mm -hmm. um, that I was on, um, my my uh, supervisor uh, was the AG, and on the opposite side, in the Lenar's case, the supervisor that was signing off on the the pleadings was the first deputy, and so those there there's the split. Mm -hmm. there within the, the office okay oh interesting yeah because you've got so many divisions that I guess it must be just so much more vast as a, um, okay interesting very interesting oh yes yeah, Senator Um I had a I guess a legal trust question the commission and members serve as a, a level of trustees yes uh, and act in that capacity. Yes. Does the Attorney General that represents the trustees, is there in legal terms that they operate at the level of trustee because they're not ordinarily um, have a, I don't know what the law is in terms of government attorneys. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a trustee level. Um, but that, no, that I, I just know. wanted, that's, a, I'm looking at, because there does seem to be, you know, it's a inherent kind of conflict to build in and how do you take you know um, unravel enough to have the conflict be settled yet not unravel the whole thing because it's already embedded and so I'm looking at different angles and so that was one if you could distinguish the legal um, level of responsibility that seemed to be different between the, um, the AG mm -hmm. attorneys and a uh, a trustee attorney would, would and, and if you're going to go into lawsuits, I don't know if that's a, an angle to distinguish, and I'm not sure if it's even useful. I'm not an attorney, so anyway, I thought I'd just put it mm -hmm. up. I'm just thinking about how we can, because this comes back how many times we've had yeah, yeah, right? So <laughs> somehow, <laughs> what's but there's something below it that's driving it. So I think mm -hmm. I wanted to sort of at least begin to at least do some research and so that we can actually get to some kind of a consensus on what's workable, because it doesn't seem quite workable, ideally yet. Yeah. Um, well, to your question, uh, pursuant to the Admission Act, the state is the trustee for the Hawaiian homelands. The Hawaiian Homes Commission Act then gives the responsibility as of the trustee responsibility of the state to the Hawaiian Homes Commission to oversee those lands. Um, insofar as our responsibility as the attorneys for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, we are the zealous advocates for the trustee capacity, which is the Hawaiian Homes Commission. And we will zealously advocate their position until such time where these off-hand situations occur where there is a inability for my office to carry on the position of the commission. Then we go through that the process that I was outlining about the waiver and the governor so the state as a trustee, then the state becomes in a conflict because the state has non-trustee responsibilities as well as trustee responsibilities. So that I guess that it starts at the at the core at the very beginning. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, let me try to make this more complicated. <laughs> you, you, so in your capacity as a, as a DAG, uh, advising the Hawaiian Homes Commission, you have two responsibilities. One is as an advocate, uh, providing advice on behalf of the commission, and the other is as a trustee standing in as an agent of the governor. Standing in as the governor's you, agent? You, that's right. Um, I don't see my position as such. I see myself, when I am advising the commission, I am the commission's attorney. There are considerations that I do provide to the commission in their business judgment. For example, I provide legal um, advice on le certain legal risks, um, but ultimately it's my client that makes the, the decision and I will But you, but you are a decision. member of a state agency. Correct. And in that capacity, you serve as an agent of the governor. That's why we have state agencies, because Josh Green can't be in 50,000 places at once. Yes, I serve at the, the pleasure of the Attorney General, and as you know, the Attorney General is appointed by the Governor. However, the Attorney General is only removed by the Governor, is uniquely positioned to be only removed by the Governor and the Legislature. Um, that is one of the few controls, I believe, that are created by the law that provides more independence to the Attorney General than, say, other state executives. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, seeing none, this is the end of our agenda. So, um, members, do you feel the need to reset for decision making to discuss my recommendations? We could, we have time, or I could just go straight into it. Or and for you guys to give input on me. Yeah. What do you guys think? Do you want to be You want to wait for your vice chair? Oh, no, can, uh, you, can take, you can take the vote because I think he's running <laughs> many, many hearings. This is. Yeah. Is the vote sheets here? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You guys okay then? Go straight into Okay. So in that case, we will go straight into decision making then. So for SB 200, this is the partial public financing of elections. Recommendation is to pass with technical amendments. Any discussion or concerns? See none then. Um, so Senator Payne. Uh, members voting on Senate Bill. 200, passing 200. with amendments. Uh, Chair Shimon Bukoro. Aye. Vice Chair Favela is excused. Senator Ihar. Aye. Uh, Senator Kilokalole votes aye. Senator Richards. Aye. Recommendation adopted. Thank you so much. SB 731, this is designated November 28th of each year as La Koa Koa, Hawaiian Independence Day. Um, recommendation is to pass as is. Any um, questions or concerns? None. Then Senator Kyo Members, SB 731 passing unamended with four members present. Are there any reservations? Any no votes? Recommendation adopted. Okay, great. Um, SB 732, this is designating the second Monday in October of each year as Indigenous Peoples Day and established as a state holiday. You know, I'm going to pass the amendments, and I think that Senator Ihara's suggestion is brilliant um, actually to trade off Election Day um, because now that we're all male elections, you know, that, yeah, we don't no longer have the need to give everybody the day off. So uh, I think that was a great suggestion. Um, and so anyway, I will recommend that and, just, and to keep it alive for further discussion. Um, okay, any questions or concerns? Okay, seeing none, so pass with amendments. Uh, members SB 732 passing with amendments with four members present. Are there any reservations? Any no votes? Chair recommendation adopted. Okay, thank you. SB 733, this is requiring OHA to establish and maintain Hawaiian culture centers within the state. Recommendation is to pass as is. Um, any questions or concerns? Seeing none, uh, Senator Kiwokolowe. Unamended? Uh, unamended. Members, uh, SB 733, passing unamended. With four members present, uh, are there any reservations? I have reservations. Uh, any no votes? Seeing none, recommendation adopted. Okay, thank you. And then SB 740, this is requiring DHHL to digitize its applicant, beneficiary, and lessee records by creating an interactive digital database software program. 
to complete it available for use. Um, recommendation is to pass with amendments. So as we discussed with DHHL, the July 1, 2024 deadline, rather than be the impl implementation deadline, it'll be the <coughs> deadline to complete an assessment um, of what this bill is asking them to do. So come up, assess, um, I guess the feasibility of it, the, the length of time it'll take, the cost, et cetera. And then the second amendment is that in section one, um, I want to revise the um, purpose section of this bill as recommended by Elmer Ka'ai. I thought he had a good suggestion to kind of neutralize the language there. And then in the committee report, I'd like to um, note that DHHL estimates the cost of this could be approximately $3 million, just for the future committees to see. Um, any questions or concerns? Chair, could you, yes. if you're going to note that in the committee report, um, would you consider also noting that that would be as a part of uh, a necessary broader strategic IT overhaul? Certainly, yes, certainly, certainly, yes. So if you can note that, Scott, thank you. Okay, any other questions or concerns? Okay, seeing none, then Senator Kukulu. Uh Members voting on SB 740 passing with amendments with four members present, are there any reservations? Any no votes? Recommendation adopted. Thank you. SB 741, this excludes from any waiting list maintained by DHHL any lessee or successor who sells or transfers their lease on attractive Hawaiian homelands. Recommendation is to pass with amendments. Um, first amendment is that I'd like to limit this to only those who sell or transfer for personal gain. And then the second amendment is I'd like to also add a provision that DHHL has the right of first refusal. Um, if a beneficiary is going to sell um, their lease, sell or transfer their lease, similar to what HHFTC has in place. So, you know, just as, as a way to kind of get towards the goal of this, this bill. Questions? Yes. Yeah. Senator, oh, uh, Senator Richards. Yeah, um, I just comments, and I, I think this is the appropriate time to say them. I hear what Chair is saying, but I'm mindful if it's a intra family transfer. Who's to say what is financial gain if, if they're doing a family transfer? So I agree with keeping this going forward and trying to find the right language. So I would support it with reservations because I want to make sure that we're not screwing up a family that has to leave a lease for whatever reason, if they're transferring it within the yeah. family or something like that. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Actually, I should, I should add that the right of first refusal would be triggered if the if the selling is for personal gain. Yeah, so, yeah. And yes, Senator Yuhara. Yeah, the, I don't recall, you said there was a bill last year that, that yes. we passed out, but did not, it was not. It ultimately uh, didn't okay. make it. So I don't recall uh, the definition of personal gain. I guess the question is who decides, and from my non-legal background, it seemed like it would be, um, I guess if there's notice, then if the commission decided, then I guess if the default is that show us your your circumstances, and if we believe it is warranted, you know, in other words, it's not for personal gain. So it's easier to define when it's not for personal gain than it was, than oh. it, you know, because I guess it's all for personal gain. I mean, you're, so if if you mm -hmm. if you show the opposite, mm -hmm. where you you can be liberal in the interpretation, but show us. Uh, your circumstances that would indicate that it was a, it was a family necessity or a, a, some kind of a necessity other than you're going to make a good deal. Yeah. Okay. That that's a good point. So now I'm trying to think that would change the amendment. Could I follow up a comment yes, on yes. that? Yes, Senator Richards. Yeah. It, what I'm thinking about is let's say we have a a family and there's a tragedy. Um, they they had a farm lot or a ranch lot, whatever the case, mm -hmm. and. Um, a family relation is willing to take it over, but they're willing to cash out, say there's a widow or a widower left, mm -hmm. and then just cash them out because they can no longer manage the property. Is that a financial gain or are they making them whole? And I think to yeah. Um, yeah. Senator Ishihara's yeah, yeah. point, yeah. you know, um, who makes the determination of what gain? Because that's not really a gain. And they probably mm -hmm. prefer having the spouse. So, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the language is yeah. except for these guys. <laughs> yeah, but, but I guess, this is a tough I guess story. that could be something that I like, can work with Scott from SMA, you know, that I hopefully you can understand where we're going with this. We're, you know, we're only trying to exclude 
those who are clearly doing this for a profit-driven motive only. You know, flipping not, properties. You know, they're not trying to help a family yeah. member or, you know, it's not some kind of reason beyond your control. Right. You know, but it's something that you have full control and you just want to, you're motivated by profit. You know, those are the people that you want to say, number one, that then you, you're, you're, you can't go back on the wait list. And number two, if that's the situation, you have to give DHHL the right of first refusal if you're going to sell. So, so, yeah, but I hear what you're saying, you know, because, yeah, it is easier to prove. One, one way would be to, to require a reason. You know, we well, that's have, true, yeah. So know, we, ha we have, uh, we waive uh, here notices for a reason. And so yeah. we just give a reason. Mm -hmm. And then as long as a reason is accepted by the commission as a reason, mm -hmm. you know, other than, you know, but if you, if it's all for personal gain, then I'm not sure how you can come up with a reason. So yeah, anyway, yeah. Just one no, yeah, one. good, very good point. Okay, so yes, I'll work with SMA. Uh, we'll on that one. But good, good, very good points raised. Any other discussion about this SB 741? Okay, see none, then Vice Chair. Uh, develop for the vote. So passing with amendments, SB 741. Okay. All right. Chair. Um, yeah, I. Okay. <laughs> Vice Chair reservations. Uh, Senator Ihara. This is Senate Bill 740. 741. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, Senator Kehoo Kalole. Senator Richards? With reservations. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. And the last measure, SB 1014. This is allowing DHHL to retain independent legal counsel. Authorizes DHHL to use services of attorney general as needed. Provides funds. Um, I want to pass with amendments and kind of like what I was kind of trying to explain during the hearing. Um, what I'd like to do is that DHHL will, will use the attorney general as, the, as their default attorney. However, independent counsel will be automatically triggered if the opposing party is the state. So it's worth a try. So try to keep it, keep the discussion going. <laughs> so um, any um, discussion, questions, or concerns? Okay, seeing none, then Vice Chair Favela. Are all members present? Have any uh, nays or reservations? Yes, I has got it. All right, very good. Okay, we are adjourned. Mahalo.